But you know, it's a really good question and you have to think about what, it's a good question to ask even like high school kids. You know, what do you love? And I ask people about that. I always ask my, you know, I ask all these weird interview questions when I'm interviewing people. I want to know what they're, what they're reading. And that tells you a lot because that's inquisitiveness. And I know in public relations and I think really in any business, it's curiosity that wins at the end of the day. You know, stay curious, be curious, ask questions. Yeah. My name is Tracy Olmstead Williams. It's uh, I started this agency 15 years ago. And so I named it Olmstead Williams Communications. Welcome to the Break Free Podcast. I am your host, David Mansala. Today we have with us an entrepreneur and somebody that is really making a difference in the area where she's impacting the world. Tracy Williams, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Tracy, you know, I've listened to many podcasts throughout my life and a lot of people come with a, a pre-recorded script of all the achievements of their guests. And for me, I just rather just open people's hearts and just let the audience figure out how amazing my guests are. So let's start with your name and where do you live and what do you do for a living? Okay, my name's Tracy Williams, Tracy Olmstead Williams. It's, uh, I started this agency 15 years ago and so I named it Olmstead Williams Communications. So um, for lack of, a, of, of something more creative, I live in Los Angeles uh california and it's actually raining today so we're very excited <laughs> since we don't get very much rain um and i've been living in la um a couple of decades now i was an east coaster from washington dc and new york and and came out here kicking and screaming thought oh i'm not an la person but once you move out here five years later you never leave and after and i have two children and after you have children in LA, you never leave because your kids want to be here. So it's beautiful. I highly recommend anybody who's listening to come visit. <laughs> so what is it about LA that people love? I mean, like I've been there many times. I'm, I live in the East Coast for over 30 years. Yeah, the weather is gorgeous, yeah. right? Uh, the scenery is pretty nice, but then you have everything else. <laughs> like you know, it's so funny. I, I don't know if I ever saw it this way before, but seeing it through the eyes of visitors, it's this possibility and it is pretty funny how we just take for granted going in to get a coffee at a starbucks or at a restaurant and you know the town is filled with people that you will see on television <laughs> or movies and right. and they're around living among you um and so i think there's that sense there's the history of hollywood um there's the tech sector here um it's it's kind of crazy. When I first moved out here, I was like, why is everybody smiling and happy? I just thought, are these people just low IQ? What, you know, there's problems in the world. But I think that because of the sunshine and, you know, the ocean and the mountains, I mean, imagine you go in the morning, dip your foot into the ocean and 45, 50 minutes later, you can be in the mountains skiing down the mountain. Yeah. You know, so just the topography alone is, it's pretty compelling. It's really beautiful. It's a beautiful place. I do love the East Coast, though. So uh, there's many, many beautiful places in the world. So I'm not saying this is it, but yeah. it's it's pretty nice. <laughs> well, weather-wise, for sure, right? Like right now, we're entering into our, our winter season. And I mean, it's been already two months of very low sun. And the, the further we get into winter, the less sun we get, like, you know, it's, it's getting dark at 4 p.m. And the sun I know. gets up and at 8 a.m. You know? And we're so <laughs> spoiled out here. And it's really funny. It's been dark and gray because of the rain. And people are like, this is so depressing. It's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> It'll be sunny tomorrow. Don't worry. <laughs> so what is your business about? Tell me a little so, bit more I'm about sorry. You. Yeah, I, I totally skipped over that. Um, I have a public relations agency. And I've been doing public relations, reputation management, crisis communications and of course now a lot of social media as well because you have to cover all of these areas and i when i started this agency i founded this agency i ran a, another agency before i founded this agency 15 years ago and i founded it during the recession it was 2008 uh, which oh. is either the worst time to start or the best time to start and i just tried to create a very positive optimistic attitude that it is the best time to start because for a long time, I was in agencies where you're always saying to clients, well, public relations doesn't necessarily generate sales. You have to do this, you have to do that. And I disagree. 
Public relations does generate sales. Public relations generates revenue and public relations generates investment in the company. So companies that are trying to generate revenue, attract investors, uh, look at selling their company, um, trying to build stronger ties with, shake, with stakeholders. And then of course with the media, they should be doing public relations. And the thing that I always am trying to get people to understand is that public relations is the least expensive tool in the marketing makeup. You know, you're not paying. You're paying for the help of the PR practitioners but you're not paying any media fees. You're not mm. paying advertise. You're not paying social media placement fees. That stuff grows really quickly for a company and enterprise. So, you know, and you're always measuring engagement, what people are seeing. Um, and I do believe that news stories, authentic, real news stories, not paid for, that yeah. is what moves the needle. And you really see it when you're measuring from the website or what register you're looking at engagement. Engagement pops when those stories are up and you just see a little percolating for a lot of the social campaigns, you know, unless a celebrity is involved or something. And then that's another enormous expense. Mm. It's now for, for the for the uh, for the people, for the audience, like most most of the audience for sure will know what marketing and sales is. Public relations is one of these things that is very few companies get into. So can you describe what's public relations, uh, what's its play in the whole marketing uh, uh, arsenal, if you will, and uh, why is it important? So there's a, a term called PESO, paid, earned, social, and owned. Owned is your website, social is paying, social earned is what public relations is. Public relations means as a company, you're getting news out about your company to reporters, to news media that would cover it. Maybe you've had a spike in uh, sales, you get those numbers out to a Bloomberg, a Wall Street Journal, trying to get part of larger stories in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, in the Los Angeles Times, whatever your daily newspaper is, Reuters, AP. Um, we're on a campaign right now trying to get a lot of broadcast in the top 20 media markets for one of our clients that's publicly traded, they're back east. And that means you've got to have a story that's visual. And so public relations crafts, who's going to be talking? What can they see? What makes for a good story to be on television? And the way you decide that is by looking at it, understanding what reporters and media want. We don't force anything down anybody's throats. They won't take it. They, mm -hmm. they're the ones who are the bosses. And so we work with reporters, we work with broadcasts, and we try to explain what here we've got this great person, a patient that can talk about their recovery, how they use this medical device, um, how doctors use this medical device to save their life. This is an important story because this person has four children and she's going to get to see her, you know, her children grow up now. So we think of the way to tell the story that the producer at the station will say, oh, this is a good holiday story. Let's do that. And then we behind the scenes, make everything happen, get the patient to the studio, um, you know, make sure that they're able to say a couple of messages about, you know, the medical device, and we help them tell their story. And so that's so different from where you're paying for an ad, where you're just saying, we have the greatest product known to man and everybody loves us. And people don't trust that, you know, mm. we, I look at, there's a trust index that comes out every year from the University of Southern California. What do people trust? And it's, it's shocking to me every year because you may say, okay, they don't trust advertising um, because they know people are sophisticated. They know that they're that's being bought. They don't trust a salesman. Okay. They don't trust politicians. That's not a big surprise, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do they trust? They trust companies and company CEOs. So that means companies, businesses have an opportunity. People, people trust them. So what we say about ourselves, if we have data about our employees, uh, we are looking towards diversity and inclusion and we want to, uh, we want new employees to come in. We want them to feel welcome. That's a story. Uh, we have a story about metrics showing that we're seeing a spike in revenue because people seem to like to do these activities that require our product. So it's just information. You're not trying to say, write a story about what a great company you are. We're writing a story that goes along with people's lives 
and what people are interested in. So that's the area we work in is, is, you know, are we own it or we're earning it and we earn it through creative storytelling. And, you know, a lot of people say we're storytellers, we're storytellers, but we're telling a story that is relevant to news media. Yeah. Plus you have to have the relationship with that news media so you can get your story placed, right? Well, you think that, I think you have to have a good reputation in public relations. Um, you know, we have a pretty good reputation and I do know reporters because we've been pitching them for years and, you know, but reporters aren't going to be your best friends necessarily because they have to be skeptical and we're mm -hmm. aware of their skepticism. In fact, I really respect skepticism. You know, mm -hmm. you have to ask why, wait a second, where's this information coming from? So. I like reporters and reporters understand that when I'm talking to them and my people, my team, we have a lot of respect for that separation of, yes, we're trying to give you a story, but we're also aware and respectful of kind of the guardrails for what kind of information you're going to take. For example, you may have a study that you want to be out there talking about that is favorable to you. So you better be really clear about how that study was created, who was behind the study, and where that data is coming from. So, you know, you're, you've got to have your facts. You, you have to have honest facts. Beautiful. Uh, now let's look back because I know you're, you're helping a lot of companies, um, making it, you know, make them visible in a beautiful way. If you think about it, my podcast is kind of that, right? It's kind of public relationships, uh, yes, relations right. because you just describe what I do. <laughs> that's right. The difference is that I'm my own venue, right? We, we just distribute everywhere. We're, People listen to podcasts, but that's that's what I do. I just I love hearing people's stories on how they're living the life of freedom that they wanted to achieve. And you're one of those persons. That's why you're here. But yeah, to come you know, up with different talk, ideas to, to to approach an industry differently. It's um, I love those stories too, David. You know, and I I love the stories that are on your podcast because sometimes it's just a little twist in the thinking that and it creates a breakthrough right it's a breakthrough that twist gives you a breakthrough yeah, and it gives you a way of talking about it because that's that's the breakthrough right it's it's um i believe not only do i believe i can prove to my clients that if we approach with honesty and tech and integrity and tell a clear clean story we're going to help them generate revenue and we're going yeah. to enhance their reputation in the marketplace. We're going to make customers admire and respect them. And we're also going to be there when crisis hits, because as you know, um, one of the most challenging things for a lot of companies right now is getting caught up in kind of the culture war crosshairs. So being really clear with companies, this is where public relations is in storytelling is so helpful. It's what is your story? Who are you? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? Because then everything else comes from that. Yeah. When you're talking to the reporter, you can say, no, this, you know, we've put a lot of time and energy into this issue. We believe strongly in it. And it, and what I, I'm trying to do with a lot of my clients is keep them in their lane. You know, what is it that you believe in? Don't go off talking about issues and trends and, you know, bright, shiny lights that could get you in trouble and that really aren't true to your heart you know and that is so important and i see many companies doing this mistake we still live under the grace of uh, freedom of speech right and for me what that means and any freedom actually my freedom ends but somebody else's freedom starts right. i have followed that all my life and that's why i have a life of freedom yes and to put it in plain uh, illustration, if my backyard starts touching my neighbor's backyard, I'm not allowed to go uh, to do whatever I wanted to do in their portion. It doesn't matter if it's an inch, it's not right. my backyard anymore. So I can plant whatever I want in my backyard, but I, I will not, I make sure that they don't even get the leaves that follow my trees in their backyard. That's because right. Because I'm respecting their freedom too. And that's what freedom of speech is about. When and, and so I have the right to believe whatever I want and to speak it in a way that is still respecting That's right. the person that don't believe what I believe. Right? 
And it's, it's very I important. That's why, and that's why public, you know, public relations it comes is, because then you set the also, frame, right? It's also choosing sometimes to not speak. I mean, sometimes we may have some very strong beliefs about an issue, but it doesn't have anything to do with our business or our people. Yeah. And so you could talk about that with your friends, with, you know, your family. You can have lots of strong opinions about politics and issues, but it's it's more that should some of that should stay within you as an individual and not with you know always always feeling like companies have had this problem in the last few years of always feeling like they have to signal that they support something or don't support something yeah. and i just want to say what well, what do you do you make this this is your service let's talk about your service mm -hmm. Don't go over there. You don't need to. Yes, you could generate a lot of publicity for one day, maybe, but then you get a lot of backlash. And yeah. I think the worst case is companies do this as a way to raise awareness for themselves and um, as opposed to raise awareness for their product and what they do. Mm. So stay focused on your business. Stay in your lane. That's true. And the lane is also your people. I mean, there's a lot of people issues in employing people. So it's very important to me that I communicate with my company, the people in my company, um, what our values are and, you know, that we share those values um, and we when we feel about them. But it's not like I'm going to go write an op-ed about every issue that goes on, you know, with individuals and people. Yeah, you know, um, the problem is social media. Honestly, with the advancement of technology and the creation of social media, people think they can just go and say whatever they want. Yeah. And they don't care about insulting or hurting anybody. And this goes for everything, right? Like, why is like everybody, because they feel protected behind a, a computer, keyboard, and a screen. They can't they be start seen. They typing whatever they want without knowing that some people might be so hurt that they could actually commit suicide. Yes. And now we have, you know, now we have uh, social media bullying for example. Oh, it's huge. Um, but on the other side of social media, social media is so incredibly valuable to brands and to business because mm -hmm. everything that I work, that we work on, we elevate through all the social media channels. And I, I do think that in social media and certainly social media and business, um, there's three words, light, bright, polite. Mm hmm. Let's be polite. Let's keep, you know, in social media, you don't need to go, you know, heavy um, and, and and make it make it fun and interesting, data driven um, and, you know, by all means, kindness, kindness for the people who are reading it. Don't, you know, yeah. don't let's not let people let's not hurt anybody in the process but it's very valuable for brands because of or everybody all they're doing is looking at their phones so when mm. we get a story let's say in the wall street journal sure there's a spike but the real value of that story is get is putting that story in social media post you know it could be facebook instagram you know anything um you know linkedin and so those i mean linkedin is a really beautiful i think linkedin is still not uh, been damaged too much um, and people really use it and I think people are, are a lot more you know professional and business like on LinkedIn and you reach a lot of people who are you know like us just trying to trying to do good work yeah yeah you know um, for many reasons personally I left social media except LinkedIn um, I mean, you still see my presence around because, you know, I, I you know, I, I have multiple businesses and I have a marketing team, so they use my face everywhere. But personally, I deleted Facebook, Instagram, all that TikTok, all that stuff. I, it was just a waste of time. But LinkedIn, no problem. It's yeah. still very reputable, still business. You can still, if you will see the, like the stuff that you see there will actually add value to you, if that makes sense. Yes, that's right. They're that not going to blame each other or start, oh, I don't believe in this sort of stuff. No, they just talk about stuff that increases business value, which is beautiful, right? That's right. I, I don't think we all, I mean, you and I can do that. I worry a lot about the younger people. And I know in my on my team, I have people that will take just a one day or two day break on social media and report being happy, you know, how much happier they are. And it's like, could you do more of that? You know, 
So it's, um, I really feel bad for young people, especially. I was thinking about this. I would just I had to be in Boston for business day before yesterday. And I was at the airport, five hour delay at the airport. Everybody's been there on a business trip. Um, and so I had a lot of people watching. And I was watching people. I wasn't on my phone. I'm not, you know, that it's like I'm. T I need a break from that. And it was everyone on a phone. Mm -hmm. And the only people who weren't who weren't on the phone with in front of them uh, were children. And it broke my heart. So I found myself like getting eye contact with little kids because they're standing there while their parent is like this for no reason. And the child is sitting there kind of looking around so mm. I could wave and the child would wave back and you think, who's engaging with these children that, you know, are... It's, a, it's a sad, but they do it on purpose. And um, they, they want to make people addicted to dopamine by yeah. giving them little bursts of dopamine all the time that you look at your phone. Yeah, I was thinking, I hope these little yeah. children, you know, these little children are probably going to get a phone way too soon. But right now they're they're looking around with innocent eyes and that's what they're seeing. So it's interesting. And it's, and it's a thing of behavior, though. Like we are, like you said at the beginning, we're sophisticated human beings. Yes. If you know that you're getting hit, little hits of dopamine all the time, and that's going to make you addicted to the application that you're using, stop it. Yeah. If you cannot handle it, don't use it. I quit it and yeah. my life is 10 times better. I gained three, four hours of my day. Yes. I was just wasting watching stupid stuff, watching stupid people saying stupid stuff that I doesn't that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my language, but it's what it was. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the social media that's going to drive people to take actions on behalf of my clients, but it's not you know, trying to change their mind about, you know, it, it, we are being manipulated. Mm. So you know, I, I went to the extreme that actually I, I quit my cable in 2011. I don't pay for cable anymore since then. As soon as the, you know, IPTV started to become usable, I was choosing what to watch on, on TV. But this year I went to the point that I even deleted all my apps for watching TV and I only kept YouTube with a premium subscription so I don't get commercials because YouTube, I can manage the algorithm to show me what I want to see, the channels YouTube that I've YouTube is great. I mean, as you right? know, YouTube is the number one search engine. YouTube is the number one social media platform. YouTube is a male dominated area too. It's interesting. It's always guys who are totally YouTube because it's a lot of how to videos. YouTube is right. so useful. Something breaks, you go on it. And I'm, and that is where I try to get a lot of my clients more engaged on YouTube because YouTube yeah. is, is, um, I know that there's a crazy side of YouTube as well, and they're going to figure out ways to monetize and, you know, ruin it. But, but right now, um, everything that our clients are doing, we make sure it's also on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and you're on, I mean, yes, it's, it's uh, you know. We're, we're there, right? Yeah, it really drives numbers and YouTube drives revenue. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Actually, if you, if you look at the history, how Google bought YouTube, for how much they bought it, they, you know, they, they, they bought it for, you know, a couple of billion dollars, but I think they make like 20, 30 billion a year in revenue yeah. from YouTube ads. <laughs> like, yeah. they, they shouldn't try to monetize more. I mean, they're already filthy rich by, you, by what they're doing and they deserve it. They're doing great. I mean, yeah. for sure, like you pay the, like, we're paying like $10 a month for the premium subscription. You have no ads and then the algorithm will show you what you want to watch. What more so we have YouTube is. studios here. I don't know if you have one in your neck of the woods, but we have a couple of really cool YouTube studios. So, you know, creators can come in like top creators. Maybe you'll qualify. You should be coming in and doing a couple of, you know, their fabulous studio out there. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> in Playa Vista. But it's so great. Crazy. I mean, those, those are great tools. You know, you've been in business for 15 years and 90% uh, of the companies go bankrupt in two years. <laughs> so to have that type of success, you need a lot of effort and there is a lot of lessons there. So I want to go yeah. back in time and tell me, where, what were you thinking when you were in high school, your last year of high school? What was in your mind? Well, I was, um, okay, I was, a, I was a triple nerd. I was a debater in high school and I was in the orchestra 
and the marching band. Um, and I really needed to earn scholarships. So I was driven because I was going to be putting myself through school. And what's the best way to do that? You've got to have something. Debate turned to be my thing. And I thought, well, that was ultimately most debaters become attorneys. And I really thought I'd go to, you know, I'd go to college on debate scholarship and then I would go to law school. And so I never even thought of this career or success of this kind of success or starting my, you know, entrepreneurship wasn't really in my mind. What was in my mind was intellectual growth, you know, being an avid reader, knowing a lot about what was going on in the world. I went to George Washington University. Being a debater, you have to know a lot of different things about a lot of different topics. We traveled all over the country. Uh, you know, we spent weekends um, on debate tournaments. You know, that would be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every other weekend. So it's a real interesting path and you just are learning about all kinds of, you know, issues, product safety. We were reading um, things from the congressional record, you know, all of that, learning how to research, learning how to write, learning how to think. And all of that brought me to this other thing where in, before I went to law school, I went to work for a company called Hill and Knowlton, a really big PR firm in Washington, DC. And that's where I was like, hey, this is what I'd like to do. So they were lobbyists. Uh, we represented a lot of European companies to the US government. And what I learned is being able to process information quickly in your brain, be creative, um, and be able to ar be articulate. You know, set up an argument, set up a discussion. And I don't mean an argument like a fight. I mean three lines of analysis to, um, you know, change a, change a point of view. Mm -hmm. So creating compelling arguments to change perspectives was my DNA. So you can say, is that, did I start out thinking that's what I was going to do? That's a little abstract, right? But it's basically like being a lawyer, right? You're going to go out if you're a litigator, you've got the case. And to me, I ended up doing that instead of going to law school. So excuse me, my light went out. <laughs> <laughs> no so, I, um, I, so I don't know if that answers your question. But I do think that having, you know, being philosophical, thinking about what, how does your brain work best? Mm -hmm. And I love solving those problems. I, I mean, a big crisis, a big litigation matter, attorneys bring us in and we sit down and figure out how we're going to talk to the media about this. This lawsuit mm -hmm. is being filed. What kind of wording should we use? What are the issues that are underneath it? So having that kind of inquisitiveness about an issue, about a company, that's that's, I think, what we're how we're different, but I think it's also how I really was able to use the kind of brain I was blown, I was born with. What what a beautiful gift to, to know what uh, your abilities are and use them to the best of your advantage and to bless the world with your abilities. I believe that you know the Lord has given us different skills to different people, and we all become like. Will become a family that contributes that skill back to the world, and that's how you gain your value. If you live in the free world, if you're blessed enough to live in North America, for example. Oh, so right? true. Yeah, I know right. that's so, that's so true. But you know, it's a really good question, and you have to think about what. It's a good question to ask, even like high school kids. You know, what do you love? And I ask people about that. I always ask my, you know, I ask all these weird interview questions when I'm interviewing people. I want to know what they what they're reading. And that tells you a lot. I mean, I don't care what they're reading, but you know, I want to know that they're reading because that's inquisitiveness. And I know in public relations, and I think really in any business, it's curiosity that um, that wins at the end of the day. You know, stay curious, be curious, ask questions. Yeah. And you know, for the audience out there, maybe for the younger audience, the fact that you are not good at something, but you love it or you're super curious about it, it will give you way more success than just pursuing something that is simple or easy to you that you may not like that much. I'm a clear example of that. You know, I went into computer science school, the best in the country, and uh, I had five other friends, and I was the worst for coding and for computer science. I was the worst. <laughs> like they had to, like my other five friends had to spend time with me explaining to me three times what the professor was speaking. But then guess what happened? My persistence and my curiosity got me the number one. I was the number one out of all of them. 
Yeah. And if you look at the, now that we're adults, like grown adults, out of the five, six of us, it's only me that runs a software, when well, many software companies, uh, so it stayed in computer science. And the second worst, which was another, my best friend, he runs the production department for me. So he <laughs> works for me and he runs delivery, right? He's the VP of delivery and operations. So that tells you the difference between me and the other guys was that I will not take no for an answer. answer and I, I was in love with the technology. I was in love with the idea that I could automate things. So they could actually do the homework maybe five times faster than I did. But when I did but it, you were it you were thinking about theirs. why. You were thinking about why. I mean that that feels very much like my standard client meeting. I'm usually sitting there and I'm not on my computer. I'm listening to them and then I'm asking them questions. And I see this even these are the people I want to hire. I was in a meeting on Monday and this young woman kept asking these questions. I'd say, for every ten questions, five were completely inane and wrong. But then there would be five that were searing. You know, it seemed like a simple question, but to answer it was going to take some effort. So, you know, out of the mouths of babes and then just out of the out of the mouths of a curious person who ask a basic question where you see a room say, well, everybody knows the answer to that, which then my response is, oh, good. What is it? And they can't respond. They can't articulate that. And I think that's what communications is so fantastic at that's why i love communications okay how can we say that in five words or less mm -hmm. you should never be you know somebody asking you about your company or your business you shouldn't be stuck you should have all of that right there and that requires some thought and work it's not that easy yeah that's for sure um what was the transition between uh, being an employee and running your own business Number one, how did you get inspired to run your own show? Uh, you know, it's the most, it's the most courageous thing for a human being to do. Let it really go is jumping through, right? As it's really job, jumping you... that fire. It's that it okay. is exactly as so many books <laughs> describe it. You know, you're you're running off the bridge, and there's all this fire, and you got to hit the other side. So there was a couple of days that were that was very very scary, like that. Um, and there's a lot of books who write about this, but I'm here to tell you that it it doesn't have to be scary for long. But mm -hmm. there is fear, and it's kind of like anything else when you're, you know, anything you're going for that you want and are passionate about. Um, I mean, when you get married, it's scary. When you have children, it's scary. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of scary things that we do and overcome. And obviously there's joy and all of that affiliated with it. But the same thing for starting a business. It's scary, like having a kid. And you just have to to push through and 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 get to the other side. And at that point, at, at the, after the fear is over, you're too busy to be afraid anymore. Because mm. you already have, before you go, you already have a plan in place. And I had a long list of all the things that I knew I needed to do in order to succeed. Because I've been in the business a long time, have to develop new clients. There's about a hundred things you need to do to develop new clients. There's books written about that. So what are the five things that are most important to getting new business in my kind of business? Um, how many contacts are you gonna make in a day? Um, outreach to people. I mean, I wouldn't end my day without having called 10 people that I spoke to, literally had a, a phone conversation with, if for no other reason than to just say hi. So all of those little touch points, I still think about all those things. I think about all the touch points that I need to make in any given day. Um, and that could be a phone call. It could be, oh, email, responding to an email right away. Take the mm -hmm. meeting when they offer the meeting. Don't put it off. Um, I really see that that's how I was wired to do okay because I also saw in my life people who were in larger group, larger agencies got, I don't know, I don't know, I always felt people were a little fat and happy. You know, the client would want the meeting and they'd say, oh, I can't do tomorrow, let's do next week. That, I, I was like, never. Tomorrow we do it. You know, we do it, you know, <laughs> and to me that's client service and it's also crazy not to. I always want to be the one who says yes. So um, it's a lot of, you know, learning to say yes and just take it and realize, oh, yes, I have eight things to do tomorrow. Might be a little crammed, but you can always fit it in. Mm. 
And everything that you think, oh, you know, I have to emotionally prepare for this. No, you just jump in and you do it. So I have so a it, real get it done kind of attitude. Isn't it crazy that everything comes down to mindset and the willingness to yes. succeed and do whatever it takes to actually get there? Do whatever it takes. And I'm not saying criminally, but but I no. mean, sometimes, <laughs> of course, sometimes yeah. you have to work late. Sometimes you have to get on a flight to Boston in a rainstorm and be stuck at an airport for six hours. Some, you know, you, you have to do things that that are um, that are sometimes physically challenging. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that means it's a okay. You got to get up at four in the morning. You've got to do this. So it's not just working hard. It's not saying no. It's saying yes to as much as you possibly can. And I know there are people saying, "Well, you've got to take back your life." I think when you're running a company, um, you're kind of always have your foot on the gas pedal. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, though? Yeah. I think there is a rite of passage for every entrepreneur. If you go through the rite of passage, if you put your effort, depending on what you want to do and how you want to live your life, this podcast is dedicated for people that are living their life of their dream, their yes. freedom. It's all about freedom, break free, right? It's for right. freedom. My freedom is not the same as your freedom. Right. Right. It, it was completely different. So for example, for me was, I did my right of passage, exactly what you were doing. I was doing the 14, 16 hour days. I was setting everything in place. It took me way longer than any other entrepreneur that I know. It took me 10 years for me. And even after 10 years, it took me, eight more years to figure out how to completely remove myself from the businesses that I have. Right. Until I finally, I finally figured out the last company that I, that I self made into a self-managing company was my bigger business. And that happened last year. To give an example, it took me three years to figure it out. So why? Because my freedom was changing. As I was moving throughout my life, my freedom kept changing. Now what I want to do is bless the world with knowledge so that other people can be where I am someday, where you are someday. How? Through running their own enterprise, to maximizing their throughput in life, to, to realizing that the value they give to the world is what they get back. I have, you know, so right? interesting you're talking about this because people always say, oh my God, Tracy, you're always, you know, got your foot on the gas pedal. Don't you ever just want to coast? And I can't, it, that almost makes me cry to think about coasting. That's like, <laughs> wh why would I do that? You know, and what else are, you know, I, I do do other things besides work. I have a family. I have lots of fun things that we do. I have a lot, I have my own hobbies and stuff. So it's not like it's, you know, 24 seven, but I do have a lot of energy and I love what I do. So mm -hmm. when people say, well, don't you want to pull back? And it's like, why? That's like, it's like you're mm -hmm. not going to finish the steak you were eating. You get a piece of lobster and you only get one bite. No, I want the whole lobster. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true, you know. And, and 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 that's the thing. When when you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. Yeah. Because it's not work; it's fun, right? Like for me, for example. Okay, I conquered the computer science world. I you know I run six technology based businesses. I have a real estate business. You know, I wanted to go back to my faith. I wanted to bless the world with knowledge, with people. Uh, I, I run three podcasts now. One of them is a Christian podcast because I'm a man of God. So, and then I run these other two business podcasts because I love hearing stories like yours. That's my new freedom. Yes. But I can only be there because I did my grinding before. Yeah. But while I was doing my grinding, I was enjoying it too, like you're enjoying it because that's what I love to do. Yeah. That's why I quit my, you know, my high salary paying job my corner office i went very high in the corporate world in it it was still computer science but i felt trapped you see no i but understand i mean I, nice. <laughs> I have an exit strategy david so my exit is um in retirement i want to play piano at the ramada inn and sing <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> it's a joke, but my husband, people, my husband will say, so what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I just want to, you know, play some show tunes and sing at Ramada Inns. I mean, I know I'm not going to be a great success, but the Ramada might have me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I was always uh, going out with one of my clients, which is one of my best friends. 
we would go out like every four or five times a year and just talk about retirement. And I remember how the conversation changed. Um, for me was, I, you know, I love uh, scuba diving. I, I, I love getting into the water. I love working out. I, I, you know, I used to love coffee. I used to love, you know, like, you know, you know, you know a scotch or, you know, a fine, fine, fine alcoholic drink. So, you know, I was telling him, okay, when, when I really get the money that I want, I'm going to open a gym and then I'm going to have a coffee bar and then a scuba shop in a beautiful place in front of a white sandy beach in the ocean. And that's, I think, my retirement. That was my, that was my idea in 2014. In 2014, you know, I became financially independent. So we were traveling with my wife throughout the world to see where we were going to retire. After five years of traveling and, and, and seeing beautiful places, we realized that going back home was our dream. Being in the, you know, being in where we are is our yeah. dream. Yes, we can take small vacations, but not retire to do that stuff. That you, if you do that stuff that entertains you and it becomes a job, you ruin it. I know. Don't make it a job. It's just, it's just got to be fun. I'm, I, I'm with you 100. percent Yeah. Excellent. And imagine if I were to follow that. I don't like alcohol anymore. I don't drink caffeinated coffee anymore. I just have a decaf coffee a day. Like all those things don't don't fulfill me anymore. Imagine yeah. the waste if I would have pursued that. Yeah, and you know, and and my voice is going. So my, I don't know if I'll be baking it to even the Ramada Inn anymore. It may have to. Be. <laughs> I may be on the promenade in Santa Monica with a keyboard. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, 40 minutes went by so fast. I would love to respect your time. Uh, I'll ask you one last question before we end the podcast. If, if you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, which is probably in, in LA, <laughs> what would you write on it? Just keep trying. Keep trying, try. And, and you know, I used to say things like work hard, but just keep trying. Mm. Trying is a, you know, just try it, try something. You know, I read a book, one of the most important books in, the, in my business world. And the book said, you start throwing stuff at the wall until you find whatever sticks and whatever sticks, then you pursue that, <laughs> right? But the thing is, don't try the same stuff at the wall. No. Try different stuff. If it doesn't stick, try something else, right? <laughs> right, right. But I just think people, I feel like everybody kind of gives up when things get hard and things can be hard or you can get, you know, social media gets you down or you feel like you're, you know, a lot of young people have, you know, depression and issues coming out of COVID. And I just, I want to see people a little bit more energized and, and just trying. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. you know, life, the downside of life is there everywhere. It's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all going to die. So it's true. The minute you're born is, you know, you, you have a death sentence in, in front exactly. of you. And we all die as part of life is natural. It's, right? It is. And so try make a mark, do something, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, it, it doesn't matter what you do. If you want to be a poet, write poetry. God, that's, I, I wish I was a poet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and you know, whatever fulfills you. And, and what, I, what, what I'm going to say last is giving is always better than receiving because giving fulfills your heart way more than getting. Absolutely. And that's my life experience. A hundred percent. I, I, I really see that. It's like, it's one of the best parts about running this company is doing for the employees, doing stuff for them. That's like the best part and doing stuff for your family and your kids. You know, it's funny. I think about Christmas. It's not what you receive. It's the most exciting thing is to look at somebody's face when you've, you know, gotten them something that they really want or, you know, brings joy to them. That's the happy part. For sure. Um, Francis, thank you so much for being in the in the show. If people like to hire your services, uh, where can they find you? OlmsteadWilliams.com. Tracy at OlmsteadWilliams.com. We are one of the top 100 agencies in the United States. According to PR news, so we're yeah, yeah, so we're out there, and we're in Los Angeles. And the thing about trying is, I take every call. I, I, you know, I'll talk to anybody. I talk to crazy people sometimes, but I'm happy to talk to people. Wonderful. One of the things that why the kids are depressed nowadays is because they don't know how to socialize. They think socializing is writing a comment on a social media post. What they need to do is learn how to go and interact with people and have real conversations. 
Yes. You know? And the and the, <laughs> the uh, and banter is something different. You know, being you know being clever in a conversation, you got to be able to. You you should have read a book that you could talk about, or seen a film, or what do you think? Asking questions, yeah. um, which is the best part. That's probably, that's actually should be my billboard. Ask questions. <laughs> Ask questions. You can spend right. five hours doing nothing but asking questions and learn a lot. Keep trying and ask questions. That's right. That's it. <laughs> Lizzie, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, God you. bless you. Have a beautiful rest of the week. And um, I'll see you around. Same to you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Blessings. That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode.